Okay, uh, welcome back to the year-end TPS that uh, we're running today. We're doing a discussion of one of my favorite books. Um, it's um, Status Anxiety by Boton. Um, I really, really love this book. I think I've read it about three times. Um, I, I find it to be clear, original, powerful, it's kind of like, uh, it feels like Philosophy 101, um, mm. but in a powerful way. It, 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 you can tell that it's written by a man that really deeply understands these things, that he can put them in such a simple and easy-to-understand format. I really enjoyed this book. What did you guys think? Oh, completely. It, uh, just the, the way it's written, the way it's written is... I, I always love, like, even on his channel, Bolton's channel, like the School of Life and stuff, I just like... How he's will how he's able to take some of these concepts and make them applicable in more con how can I put this concrete ways than some people are willing to do sometimes w when they do philosophy, um, and this book is is I don't know it, it seems directly applicable right you can see what he's talking yeah. about all the time you never lose the plot. This is one of the few books that you couldn't be like what's this pie in the sky philosophy metaphysics garbage. This yeah, is about yeah, yeah. a real problem. It identifies a real problem and gives you real solutions to a problem in life. Um, maybe his maybe this is like his best vision of what philosophy is. It's kind of solutions for life. Mm. And um, he's done exactly this in this book. This book is about nothing, you know, I don't know, metaphysical or they would, you know, maybe you have to like somehow work out. It's plain, simple, and it's something that we deal with every day in our lives. Um, and in a very intense degree. Um, you know, I, I have several friends that, if I had to diagnose them, I'd say they all suffer from intense, severe cases of status anxiety. Mm. Um, I mean, I think America itself suffers from an intense status anxiety at every possible moment. Uh, mm. Most people are sucked into a, a, a crazy battle for status. Um, the right. Be sure to uh, like this video. <laughs> yes, yes. We are, um, yes, yes. Like this video, thumbs up. Give us more yeah. status so that yes, we can... uh, follow us on Twitter. Uh, if <laughs> the more followers we have, the better people we are. Yeah, we're gonna have more subscribers in the School of Life. So. More, the more thumbs up we we get, the better the video is. Obviously, uh, obviously, right? That's I read this book. Uh, that's the message I got. Wait, no. <laughs> <laughs> um. So obviously, um, the first part of the book identifies the problems. And then the next part of the book is the solutions, or the causes, as he says, the causes of this. But, I mean, it, it's kind of interesting. It, I love the causes. Um, there's just simple five simple causes, lovelessness, snobbery, expectation, meritocracy, and dependence. Um, and uh, all of them, in a crazy way, come back to what's great about us, or what's great about are the, the latest political idea in the last, I don't know, 500 years or so, mm -hmm. right? Equality. Equality. Uh, equality has come to kind of bite us in the ass in a way that we had never seen before. Our strength is our, our greatest strength is our greatest weakness. And I, uh, equality can make life difficult to live, um, mm. which is something that it's kind of interesting idea that, that equality makes life difficult to live. But I, I like the fact that uh, all of these, lovelessness, snobbery, expectation, meritocracy, independence. You know what they all remind me of? All the causes of status anxiety? They all remind me of advertising campaigns. Um, just think of the way you're advertised products. Mm -hmm. And um, they basically just use every single one of these in a way to sell you things. right? I mean, in other words, corporations and PR guys know exactly what pushes your buttons. As to how to get you to get their product, right? One lovelessness, right? So of course they'll show a bunch of guys getting together and having a beer, or with a beautiful girl, or a family together partying down, right? You want that love, or how about snobbery, right? Oh, you're 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 part you're part of the better class, a nice classy black label on your can or your car, or even high quality beers, or um, meritocracy and even dependence, right? Dependence is simply like, well, you're dependent on the world, so buy our insurance, right? Who knows what's going to happen? Damn. Um, I mean, these are all just basic advertising strategies. Um, th this is the way products are being sold to you every single day, and they know exactly what it takes to make you feel anxious and afraid and nervous about the future. I mean, he, he uses those wonderful pictures in the book, too, the ads in the book. I mean, they're very illustrative of what he's talking about. 
Um, you know, like, well, the ads about who's having dinner with your client and all this stuff. Well, this is toward the end, but... Yeah, I mean, like, this is just something... It's not just a pressure you live with because you see the guy next to you, right, getting a better house than you or a better car than you. It's it's it's, it's in your house, too. It's like it, the call is coming from inside the room. The TV is just showing you again and again. Even, even in your times of relaxation, mm. it's showing you constantly these messages of... Well, uh, look at this family on TV. They've got a lot of love. Why don't you? Right? Look at this family. They've got a nice big house. Why don't you? Um, you know, all the houses on TV, if you watch those, even horror films or any kind of film, like a regular TV house, those are big houses. Mm. Like, those are high-end middle-class houses, if not lower, lower upper-class mm. houses on a lot of these TV shows. Like, and that's portrayed as like, well, that's just the standard American home. Right, um, Does and you're like it's weird looking at it from Japan, right? I mean, it looks like when Japanese people say, like, "Wow, what crazy huge houses!" But I'm like, even these, this is too big, right? Don't you think so when you watch TV? Ah, mm. oh, oh yeah, uh, definitely. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Of course, actually, I you know people don't believe me when I say this, but I'd say anywhere other than Tokyo, the Japanese houses are larger. Yeah, 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 because they actually have more. Because what's expensive here is the space. But, I mean, th think of the houses that they show. The Japanese uh, TV shows, too, I guess they don't really dwell so much on these houses, but American TV shows, American family sitcoms, even Roseanne's house, kind of big. Um, where are the poor houses? Where are the small, dingy houses? And if there is a small, dingy house, it's usually a sound that the person's a psychopath or a weirdo, right? Yeah. Right. There, there is no, I don't know, where is the noble poor house? They don't really appear that much on TV. True Detective, right? Uh, when that guy is, in, I don't know, one of the characters is True Detective, too. He has a crazy, furniture-less, crazy small house. But he, they're trying to show him as being a lunatic, right? Mm. So I, it just kind of feels like you're just bombarded with... Messages that you're not doing good enough every single day of your life, at every moment in your life. And hmm. So is it any wonder that you feel this way? Um, I don't know. I, I find it eerie. Hmm. Constant eerie thing. Yeah. Um. But, the, but there's a catch to this, right? There's, a, there's an interesting catch to this, right? Like the same thing when we talk about Japanese and their relation to their Japanese stars here. Right. They don't feel envy. Exactly. Of, they this don't feel envy to towards their stars, right? They yeah. feel just like we don't feel envy. Maybe I don't feel envy towards Bill Gates. Mm. Or, maybe, or you're, I don't know. I don't know who I think. But you feel envy to those closest yeah, to you. You right? feel envy towards people in your peer group. Yeah. People you feel are in your peer group. But I guess the the larger you feel your peer group to be, the bigger. Right. Yeah. The and that's what's happened, have. right? The the, the extent of our peer group has increased so large that basically they're they're out there telling you every day on TV you could be Bill Gates. Yeah. Why don't why aren't you Bill Gates? Obviously you're just not working hard enough. Mm. If you work hard you can succeed and do anything, right? Bill Gates pulled himself up by his bootstraps and he made, you know, Microsoft. Uh, there was no coincidences there. It was it was one man's genius or Steve Jobs is you know, this kind of super genius that uh, revolutionized computing all by himself. You know, had nothing to do with where he was born or what education he got or where he happened to be living at the time. No, no. Why can't you all be more like Steve Jobs? What are you, losers? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. What are you, losers? Well, the answer, it comes back. Uh, it's not even that Steve Jobs has worked harder than you, which, of course, there that is part of it. But the bigger element is that he's just a better person than you. Yeah, well, yeah, he's a better guy. Yeah, he's yeah. I, I love this, like, kind of like, this is like, why aren't you all studying to be Steve Jobs kind of BS that you get sometimes, too? Right? I mean, the Japanese are all over this, right? Like, I, yeah, oh like God. The Japanese government is like, well, um, why can't we have a Steve Jobs in Japan, right? They're all over this. They're trying to figure out why isn't the next Steve Jobs come from Japan? Um, well, because you're only looking at Steve Jobs, yeah. right? Steve yeah. Jobs didn't pop out of the ether. Steve Jobs popped out of a creative community that was building up in California and in their area at the time, a kind of free Wild West kind of 
take anything, steal as much as tech as you want kind of weird zone that happened to open up for a small period of, I don't know, 10 years maybe uh, in one period in history in the United States. Do you think that like this kind of, I don't know, barred down in regulations Japan world is going to have room for Steve Jobs? Steve Jobs is a pirate and a maniac and a dictator. Um, that ain't going to fly. Well, yeah. though, you see, you're missing the point, though. What Steve Jobs did was he just read Steve Jobs' book. Yeah. Right. He had the script. Right? Yeah. He had the script. <laughs> so I guess... That's why you, you know there's a Japanese a Japan yeah. only manga version of Steve Jobs' book, right? <laughs> oh, okay, yeah. wow. I, I have to check that book out. I kind of want to see so it. Me too. <laughs> I did a manga of Steve Jobs' life. But, it, like, studying to be Steve Jobs is like, I don't know, the statues of Daedalus or something. I was going to say, like, isn't this eerily reminiscent of Mino? Does he think, is it possible, Socrates, to teach excellence? Well, he said virtue, but in virtue, arate, right? That's just excellence, right? That's exactly what all these people want. This yeah. is exactly what Mino wanted, right? He wanted to be able to be taught to be successful, right? And this is this. He, the, I don't know. Maybe maybe Mino is suffering from status anxiety. No, he was in the shadow of Gorgias. Yeah, exactly. Right. He's like, can you teach me to be great? I was, and at the end, Socrates is like, no. <laughs> Maybe he's probably joking around with him a little bit, but and, and even if you could, it would have to be it would have to use philosophy to get there, right? You'd have to generalize it out to such a huge degree, like well, perhaps creativity is involved, right? Or perhaps taking chances is, is involved, but you'd have to generalize it out to such far out places that you know these are this is what these people are looking for. You know, you, this isn't your Robert Kiyosaki telling you to unleash the power of the businessman within you or something. Uh, like, there's going to be no steps for you to follow, unless it's buy gold, because I bought gold too. Mm. It, it's just, it, it's not going to be that easy. And whatever the Japanese government is up to, I think they think, like, well, if we just read Steve Jobs' books enough, right, well, they're just going to have to make another Steve Jobs, like... But, but by the time you make that Steve Jobs, it's already too late. He's dead, Right. <laughs> we well, don't need another Steve. We need the next Steve Jobs, right? Where's that guy coming from? No, no. What we need is a time machine and another Steve Jobs. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> See that? Whew, if only we had that time machine, right? He's going to go back and kill the original Steve Jobs and take his place. Well, right. Of course, the, uh, the irony about uh, that is that uh, if we had a time machine, I could be the, the, the next Steve Jobs. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you could, right? But isn't it kind of weird, too, that, like, these computer maniacs, too, they were like the bohemians, right? Like, mm, they weren't these computer maniacs, these crazies on the outside in Silicon Valley. People were probably making fun of them. They're mm -hmm. like, what are you lunatics doing with your beep boop bop boop computers? we got to make some real money out here. This is California, land of money in Hollywood. Come on. What are you fooling around with, you geek? Uh, but they broke through anyway. And now computers are serious business. Right? Like, just look at Steam. They're releasing crappy games all the time now. Uh, right? It's serious business now. Right? You can go to school to be a game programmer right now. <laughs> that wasn't a thing a little while ago. That was something that you would do if you were not a serious person. Now it's a serious thing. Now you can find out how to trademark your company and what you, right, how I, you can budget it if you want. That so, if, if anything, it. we had to learn that you maybe to open up a new industry, you shouldn't actually be obsessed with status. Because that market has already been drilled. All right, like maybe you have to go to crazy new places to, to, to open up new values and new ideas and make things serious business. So, I, but no one learns that, right? Like they're always like one step late in, in joining the hype train to the new thing, right? Well, well, now computers are serious. Oh, now let's all try to be Steve Jobs. Really? Were you saying that thirty years ago? Were you? I don't know. Kind of makes me fishy. I don't know if the Japanese were saying that 30 years ago. Like, <laughs> oh. <laughs> like it's like they, they saw success and they're like, oh, that means it's good. Okay. Whew. Now everyone copy that. Right? <laughs> <laughs> because success means good. <laughs> right, right. right. <laughs> like, you know, the, the fact that they like, they're all too willing to crush their own, you know, 
basically, I don't know, very injured, starving cultures, right? Like, you know, their animation industry and their games industry, they could care less if they stamp those things out of existence right now. At least that's the attitude they're taking towards them. And, um, you know, maybe one day when we, they see games as serious business, they'll be like, what happened to our game community? Whatever happened to that? Oh, man, kids these days, and they're getting away from games, right? What happened? Like, you destroyed them, right? Like, uh, this obsession with the status anxiety, or status itself, can crush out new industries. <laughs> it kills the chance for making the new Steve Jobs. It really just burns me up. Um, it seems like like an obsession with status is, can can actually end up crushing and open opening new doors and crushing the way to, to see new things. Well, everything is routed into just one way, just the, this kind of real instrumental do what you need to do to succeed right in the way things are right now. I mean, yeah. that's that's all it leads to. I mean, that's why it's interesting. I mean, like when you hear those... Well, this goes all the way to the end, though, the, the bohemian section. But when you hear these bohemian guys, like you kind of cringe a little bit when they say things like, we're here to liberate you from rationality. <laughs> Right, and you're kind of like, ew. Uh, but, you know, I mean, that's what they mean, though. I mean, they mean, like, to get outside of this kind of instrumental reason of society, right? Like, to th this is the way to succeed. You go up, you grow up, you, you, you join a company, you become a salary man, and then you, you move up the corporate ladder or whatever, right? This is what they want to break you out of. I hope yeah. it's not literally to liberate you from reason itself. I <laughs> I, I don't think that would be if a kind of harsh reading. The statement wouldn't make sense. Exactly right. I mean, why would you even bother then? Yeah. So as long as they've got you caught in, in their social nets right now, they can they can, they they know who's the winner and who's the loser. And um, if you're watching this on YouTube with us, you're probably a loser. Oh, I'm sorry. Wait. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> maybe maybe no. it just means you care about other things. Uh, well, we have to put that caveat there. there. You're probably a loser, but you won't be if you keep watching our videos. <laughs> yes, right. of course. Of course. Oh, People no. will love you. It's, it's like Rudolph. <laughs> you know what? I, I, I'm, I'm going to go with anxiety. If you keep on watching this, you're going to be even more of a loser. Um, because oh, we're not going to oh, play that game. You, you, you're like now you're doing the whole edgy thing. Like we're yeah. bohemian. We're gonna we're outside of the whole system. Well, <laughs> you know those big YouTube channels. They're the worst ones. <laughs> they play to the masses. <laughs> the crappy ones are the good ones. Stick with us hey, <laughs> until we wait. get to be popular, and then we're good. <laughs> We're gonna we're, ride that big wave. We're gonna we're gonna do our own thing. We're not gonna listen to anybody, right? Hey, hey, we might as well own it, right? It's not as if we're here, like I don't know. We might as well own what we are. Uh, we're not here giving people advice on how to do business, and how to do uh, how even how to program, or I don't know how to do some kind of practical skill, electronics or something, or carpentry. We're not doing any of that here. So why don't we just own it? Or we don't just just own up to who we are. I don't believe in society's values. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, like, I have to say, like, I don't know. I'm pretty sympathetic to this. What did he quote? Was it from Stendhal at the end where he said, um, "Money or being successful, ah, commercial success, money. Oh, here it was. That was money and work, work a day occupations corrupt the soul or destroy the capacity for tender sentiments. I can't. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I feel that. I do feel that. Um, in me anyway. Uh, I do. At least, at least, it, when I go to work. When I go to work and, and I just see the people around and like other, the, some of the people I have to interact with and it just feels like the whole thing's set up in such a way that like you can only just kind of shudder, right? You know, like what do you do with all? I mean, the only thing you can do is just kind of just slowly become more and more corrupted. On my on my bad days, those are my thoughts about moving up in the company. Like uh, when I see some of the people, I'm like, how does my boss deal with this guy? Like he obviously wouldn't take any sound advice. So what is he just like? Let him rant for thirty minutes and then like say, "All right, thanks, thanks for the meeting. You can go home now." I mean, what what is the? I don't know. I I have a lot of sympathy for this bohemian critique of work culture. Um, 
I, I it like I find I don't know me personally too like my best thinking time is either in the morning or at two around two thirty. I mean what that when you're at work that's when you're at work. So kiss all that good the kiss all that time goodbye. Um, unless I can you know squeeze it in on a break or something. Um, it feels like yeah all my energy is directed toward just getting. I'm to sure the that's day. how Plato wrote the Republic. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> in the ten minutes in break. Time. In the ten minutes in break time, like uh, he's he's on the train, he was on the subway, yeah. he's like making little notes, he's constructing the Republic sentence by sentence. All right, like well, let's just be a blunt about it. I'll just be more even more blunt about it. I don't consider society's heroes my heroes. I don't consider Steve Jobs a hero, or at least not for the same reasons other people do. I don't consider Bill Gates a hero for the same reason that other people do. Um, when you say other people, you mean just because he was financially successful? Yeah, he yeah, you know, okay. he changed the world by making a mega corporation. In fact, I don't I don't find Steve Jobs to be much of anything, to be perfectly honest, um, other than a dictator. Um, but he had determination. I'll give him that. But uh, b- before before I'd rate Steve Jobs anywhere on my list of top ten people, um, you know, Plato would definitely be way up there, and so would Socrates and Nietzsche and Hegel. Um, and I know, I, I think all of us would, like or Wittgenstein, um, when we're, we're ranking people or who I admire, who I look up to, uh, basically it, the people I look up to are called losers. I look up to what people would call losers. In other words, like I kind of like, you know, like the dude. Um, we abide here in philosophy world. And um, yeah, wars not make one great. So I'm not, I'm not even looking up to great Jedi masters. Uh, basically, my top people are artists and philosophers. Mm. Um, and you know what? I've heard all this stuff. I've heard it all said before. Like, well, they don't do anything. They're losers. They don't make any money. They're crazy. They're weird. Um, yeah, but I don't care about your heroes. I, I hate your heroes. I don't like them. Uh, I don't like your warriors. I don't like your businessmen. I don't find them interesting. Uh, so I'm just going to own up to what I am. I, I admire different kinds of people. My heroes have never been those people. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I'm just going to, I would have to say, I mean, I have no objection. I, that's me too. I mean, I really, I have no interest in becoming a mega super businessman or I'm even scared at what it would take for me to do that. Like, I don't even really want to even put in that effort to do that. I feel like all the time I would waste doing that would just make me sick. Uh, I, 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 I can't. I can't. I would much rather be on, on this crappy YouTube channel <laughs> doing these videos. <laughs> and I think I would die with, I would die with very much fewer regrets if, if this is what I did um, rather than like climb to the top of my company. I have to attest it's going to be in my kind of unique work situation to where it's either go up, up or go there. Um, there is there is no stay, stay in. And, you know, I've, that it kind of forces me to position where I do have to put in an effort to go up. And I do sit so there thinking, you know, I'm constantly thinking, why the hell am I doing this? I would much rather there be, you know, rather than having my, God, was it like seven months this year? Seven <laughs> months where I was not participating in this? Yeah. There's it was a long time. Yeah, yeah, it was. Shockingly I long time. Much you know, rather have that seven months with you guys and the the menial success that that's that's that I that's got out of that work, but I it's not really the option my situation. And I it does sometimes make me feel what I think about it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, I definitely, I do not, you know, oh, these same merits that most people judge, I judge by society. I, that's not my ruler. Mm. Well, let's jump into this just a little bit. What do you think about this? Um, Bolton gives us really interesting quote on in the book. I would give a page number, but you guys don't have my version of the book. But anyway. Uh, he says when in the when discussing meritocracy, which I mean we're talking about work, so why not talk about meritocracy a little bit? He gives this really nice little quote. It says things changed in the news stories, like 
in the older stories about your position, like status, your know, low standing was not was kind of separated a bit more from moral status. But then he said a couple of new stories started taking over. I mean, every one of these things should have some common sense, intuitive force, right? Um, this is this is this is what I really like about what he does. He's trying to pull at you from every direction. You should see all of these and and be like, oh yeah, I can see that. Um, but in, in one of the new stories uh, of of meritocracy, the one where the the rich the rich are the useful ones and and not the poor, whereas previously the poor were the useful ones and not the rich, but in the new version, the the rich are the useful, not the poor. He talks. He says, um, in judging a man's value, um, this is in the new story. Now, in judging a man's value, one had to look not at his soul as Christian moralists were inclined to, but at his impact on others. Um, isn't it? I mean, don't you think a lot of people deeply need this? They 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 feel like their life is meaningful via its impact on others, right? So they want to, the reason they want to climb that corporate ladder is because they want to. They feel important if their life touches many other lives. That's what's important to them. It doesn't. It, I don't, it, are they thinking about how? Of course, they don't want it to be bad. But I mean, like. You kind of like you're 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 in a you're a big wig, right? You, like there are there are what well, well, there are four hundred there are four hundred members on my ship, right? There are four hundred people in my crew, right? You know what I mean? Like I've got this many people below me. I'm touching this many lives and and affecting this many people. I'm much more important because of this this large vast quantity of consequences my actions have. Don't you think? I think people want this. This is why they run to these. Everyday heroes, the ones you were talking about, Dustin, the ones that the ones that are climbing up the corporate ladder. Um, no, oh, yeah, of course, yeah. I mean, it might need might be, it might be more more worse than that. It might be that they want to dominate. Oh, I think that that's definitely there too. Wow, like you bring it in Nietzsche here a little bit, but yeah, definitely. I mean, I I, I totally agree. That's true. I I just think, um, like this this is. People, how people get a little, they feel like their life is more meaningful if, like, what they do has a larger impact. I mean, it's, it's just real simple logic, I think, but it's intuitive, no? No? Of Whereas, course. It doesn't really, I, I kind of, this is the point that tears me apart a little bit, too. But, I mean, you know, like, Epictetus would call me a fool if I thought that was true. Right, you know, this is what Epictetus is like. You know, you're stupid. Um, the only thing you can do is control your actions, and you have to be a good person, and that's it. Right. Whereas, I mean, I, I you kind of want to do affect some good change, right? Yeah, okay. I think people. Okay. Just I mean, like, that's fine, but the problem is, like, it, the world is not that nice. It's when they're when they're head of the plastic corporation, um, they may be affecting a lot of change, but. I mean, God knows they, they're not even sure themselves whether it's good or bad or what the hell's going on. They're just happy they're dominating over a thousand different employees or something, right? But I guess the point of it is, uh, yeah, okay, I think it's good to want to influence people in a good way, but there are more ways of influencing people other than being the head of a plastic company. Yeah. Right? I mean, like, for example, being a great artist or a great poet or a great mm -hmm. philosopher, or a great musician, or et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, these are just as good and useful ways, and, and not this kind of utilitarian, practical, let's get is, down to brass tacks kind of crap. This is kind of where I was thinking, cause, but I mean, like, I think a lot of people just, I don't know, maybe, maybe uh, I don't know, like, like, they, they I, I don't know, I feel like a lot of people around, uh, I've talked to, or are, they 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 they're they're more like I could be a nice person, but what does that matter? You know what no, I mean? Like that's that the should be the reply to Epictetus. But that's the problem. Yeah, exactly right. Like they they, they don't have any other criteria for judging a good life rather <laughs> than which other people can be judged. Yeah, yeah, right. Like they they lack that other criteria, so they want this one, this yeah. one, this 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 just influence impact. <laughs> They want the one that's easiest to see. And power yeah, right. You can see it. You can measure it. it. Yeah, right. Um, Brutal, vicious power is the easiest one to see, right? Mm. Um, you can always oh. check that one. 
also the easiest to obtain. Yeah. Mm. Now, if you were to ask these people, you know, listen, if you could have the power of the president of a powerful corporation or the power of, you know, I don't know, Michelangelo, or the, influ- the lasting impact of Michelangelo, well, most people would take would say, you know, I'd rather they're taking you know, Michelangelo for those power. Or I would rather, you know, have my nunchucks and, and be groovy and have a uh, skateboard. And eat pizza, right? <laughs> but, yeah. but no, most people <laughs> would prefer that artistic influence, but that's not a skill most people can, that's a type of influence most people can aspire to. Mm. No, hey, look, I can't draw, can't paint, and can't do nothing like that. What power should I grab? I, I want to grab four power. Mm. What do I grab for? Okay. Hey, being a butcher, Joe, being a shotcha, Joe, whatever, you know, oh, in the corporate world, that that next run is always just out of reach, so you can always aspire to, to it, but... Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, you're forced yeah. to work every day anyway. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. you're being a good person isn't good enough, right? Like, yeah, right, exactly. Being a good person isn't good enough. For some, I mean, I think it isn't. I really think it isn't. For, like, they, they, this is the, what Socrates in the Republic... They're kind of like Socrates is like you know being, being being having a just soul is kind of a reward in itself, and you could you you would be happy dying thought an unjust man, uh, and you'd be better off than the guy who th- everyone thought was just but actually was unjust, and was lauded right. You'd still be better than that guy. I mean, this is the challenge of Socrates too in the Republic. I I, I don't know. Um, I I I, mm, I, 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 I do. I think there's something fundamental. People, uh, maybe they were come into consciousness through the recognition of others. What were you saying about Hegel? Anyway, okay. So there's there's something that like there's it's a tough. I mean, like it's it has to be weaned off of something that's almost fundamental to who you are. I mean, mm. or, or, they, or some. Hmm? Yeah, maybe they're they're multi-headed beast. Beast is a little bit. Uh, you know, his power over the tripartite soul is a little too much. <laughs> yeah, and I think it's that. That's why you need help, right? Like, it's 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 too difficult without any help to. I don't know how can I say it in a weird Kierkegaardian way resist the mob, uh, yeah. of people. It's just too difficult to do. Yeah. Um, so that you need certain solutions, um, so that you can you don't get caught being a cog in a machine, basically, uh, doing something that you don't even believe. Perhaps you don't even believe yourself is good or interesting. Yeah. I mean, I really loved. This is this is this is a real difficult problem. I mean, I just loved in the beginning in, lo, in the lovelessness section where he said, like, look, he said, like, look. I mean, this is so true. Like, when you look at yourself, when you really look at yourself, you, you, it's diff, diff, it's really difficult to figure out exactly what you are. You you see moments when you seem to be clever and moments when you seem to be boring. You you see moments when you you, you seem to be. Um, Re- really, uh, really funny, and and really moments when you when you seem like you're not funny at all, right? You, you, you just there's this mix, and the only the only way to to get that answer is to look at how other people react to what it is you're doing. Like, and this is what Susan Wolf brought up too. Like, it was brought up, you know, when so- Susan Wolf in the Meaning of Life book, where they were bringing up re- replies to her. They're like, that guy, he was like, you know, like sometimes you're you're some people. Are bordering on the edge of insanity, right? Like they appear to be insane by sticking to their guns, right, and, and hoping, it, it, hoping against hope that someone will recognize what it is they're doing. Yeah. Um, but I mean, I guess I, I just want to say that that's that's not the only thing we have available. We don't always have to go back to people. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Or maybe different. the people, even or the people around you. Anyway. Yeah, necessarily the people around you, maybe people in the past you can right. use, or maybe even well, reason it's, itself. Or people in the future. People in the future, reason itself. Yeah. I mean, that's the solution of philosophy, right? I mean, in other words, something to get you unstuck mm. from being kind of a, I don't know, a cog in other people's uh, value systems, basically. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Kind of a, a little breathing room, how about that? It's not like you have to unstick yourself from the world. Like, like, yeah, you, know, you just be over here, and you, you know, I don't know. You can be like a Zen monk up in a mountain somewhere. Although, be my guest if you can't do that. Go ahead. Most people probably can't do that, but there are solutions. There are ways you can break free and give yourself a different standard. Um, and I guess he does present uh, five solutions. Yeah, five. 
in, in the book, um, philosophy, art, Christianity, politics. Oh, oh religion. Religion, well, religion um, politics. Politics and Bohemia. Bohemia, yeah. oh, sorry. Religion. Well, actually, in the newest version, it is Christianity. Really? Yep. Oh, wow. Uh, he just, this, I have the older version. It just says religion. So he changed yeah. it to Christianity. Huh. Yeah. Interesting, because I suppose he thought, like, oh, well. Okay, so maybe he thought, like, religion was too, too broad, broad um, and he changed it. Yeah, well, if you put, like, for, like, Buddhism. Yeah, it wouldn't apply, would it? Yeah, Buddhism, Hinduism. So um, he probably figured, this this is whole story, right? Right, is the, how Christianity used to save the peasants from status anxiety by saying, you know, we're all equal in the eyes of God. Mm -hmm. uh, they're, Worth is not your worth on this plane. I mean, the meek shall inherit the earth. Mm. So it, it makes sense for that to be the, the reverting back, well, reverting thing, reawakening, re, being reawoken to that, that makes sense as a solution, I suppose. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I guess Sh Shinto doesn't seem to have so much of that, for example. There's lots of big rocks, though. Yeah. There could have been a chapter on big rocks. Shinto seems to be a lot of ancestor worship. Yeah. So it doesn't seem to have... It has different aspects to it. Right? But Ka Yeah, well, I suppose like Kami and Shinto are kind of like enormous or great things, like awe-inspiring things, like big trees and big rocks, but... Um, or they inhabit those things. Anyway, um, so, okay, yeah, maybe it was a good choice to change it to, to Christianity. But yeah, those are the those are five solutions he pointed. I did like, uh, of course, philosophy was the first one. Uh, yeah, it's my it's my favorite one. So how does one resist from 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 joining in everyone else's value system? I guess you you use your reason to find out what's a legitimate value system and what's not. What the legitimate yeah. judgment of you is and what a legitimate judgment of you isn't. Yeah, 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 yeah. And you you kind of shelter yourself with that. But you don't. You just like you know the Stoic said. You let the good stuff in. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you if you just like made something up, <laughs> it would have like no legitimacy. Um, it's got to be anchored in something other than just like whatever I think. Um, well, some people do a fairly decent job, not a good job, uh, but. They're Anybody who does a spectacular job, but some people do a decent job at just making that ruler up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is partially in Christianity, too. I mean, like, there's this UFC fighter that's got tattooed on his back, only God can judge me. Um, mm. which kind of, in other words, worldly judgments aren't enough to condemn me uh, in but, this world. You, you, the UFC fighter? Yeah. That's an odd... Uh, because the referee judges them eventually, right? Yeah. It's like, <laughs> I, I didn't lose. Because who are you to tell me I lost? No. Well, see, if I were to come up and say you're a loser, man, you'd say, well, only God can judge me. So. <laughs> and, and then he'd probably just punch me in the face and knock me out. So, <laughs> <laughs> again, not only I, I can't judge him either, uh, because <laughs> I'm afraid of him. I mean, okay, I mean, that is, is the message. It's like, you know, I can kick any of your asses. The only person who can judge me. <laughs> Because he's the only person who... Thank God that I'm in there with him, so that we all equal. It's somewhere in the universe, right? Otherwise, <laughs> it would be too unfair. Uh, but Christianity does have something of this in, but I think philosophy might do a better job of it. Mm. Um, in other words, it kind of uses a rational value system to let in the right critique of the world. So I mean, you know, and Bolton's got in a whole other book about the comforts of philosophy. So he's like, okay, we've done enough in philosophy. Yeah. Art is where it's, he starts talking a lot more about art. Art is interesting, so let's talk about art. How, how can art save you from status anxiety? Mm -hmm. I like it a lot. Um, so, I mean, like, one of the basic ways is that it can show you that uh, the world isn't fair. I like that. Like, one of the sources of status anxiety is you thinking the world is all fair and right, but it can show you that there are bad people in good places and good mm -hmm. people in bad places. Mm -hmm. is a way to do that. Um, you know, I don't know. Like we were talking before, kind of like Star Wars, kind of does. Um, you know, Luke Skywalker is a uh, he's a good guy, but he's kind of like a farm boy. Yeah. And uh, the Empire are bad people, and they rule the galaxy. Um, 
So not necessarily the powerful aren't necessarily good. Therefore, yeah. aiming for the top isn't necessarily a good thing to do. And before Yoda got all screwed up, <laughs> Yoda was an example of that. Like, and he was still on Dagobah. Yeah. Right. That was that was where the way I appreciated Yoda. And when you watch the prequels, you see that in that necessarily intelligent people are in the Jedi Temple. Oh wait, no, sorry. That's, not, that's not the lesson. Wait, that's Yoda again. Oh, anyway. sorry. Ignore the prequels. Uh, that's not what the lesson they were trying to tell you. <laughs> in the original trilogy, uh, maybe that was a lesson you could learn. That the Empire mm. is not good, whereas, I don't know, the earthy people, the earthy rebels are, are the good people. Although they enjoy, let's just say, a poor status in the fictional universe of Star Wars. The status of garbage, basically. Yeah. Scum. Scum, Rebel, yeah. Rebel scum. So this is a way Star Wars can do that. Um, but I, I really liked what he said. Like Then he broke it down into the essence of comedy and the essence of tragedy. Tragedy, yeah. Um, so I don't want to talk about tragedy first. I think sure, tragedy. yeah, yeah, yeah. I think, uh, well, let's talk about tragedy because it kind of relates to I, what we our video from before. Don't you think? I mean, this what he says about tragedy... I think eminently applies to Fuminori from Song of Saya. Um, yep. So this tragedy... I mean, I think the long and short of it is tragedy teaches us that... Uh, it, it, re it teaches us to rethink failure, right? We all have it in us to fail. Um, and uh, it's not something... It's not something extraordinary about you that's making you fail per se. It, it's it's part of just our human condition. And you could have easily walked down that path in similar circumstances. Yeah. Um, to put it I bluntly, mean, like sympathy for the devil, right? Yeah. Right. I mean, and just like like in Fuminori, I mean, like you you kind of I think that was part was part of the point, right? You look and he's like he's in the car accident and you know like he 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 he's everyone is monsters. You, you kind of have a strange sympathy for him. You kind of like yeah. Yeah, from his it. point of I view, the, the world is monsters, right? Yeah, right. I get yeah. it. I, I, I can see why he would just be losing yeah. his mind. Um, yeah, or, or a different a different way is Breaking Bad, right? Mm. I mean, it, it makes you feel sympathetic for a drug dealer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. A, a meth dealer. Uh, it's, it's tough to do that kind of stuff. Or for a man that's having sex with a monster, in Fuminori's <laughs> case. <laughs> um, <laughs> Which is also hard to do, or I don't know, District Nine or whatever. Um, but yeah, it, it kind of gives you sympathy for I don't know failures, people that have failed, or unlikable people, mm. otherwise unlikable people mm -hmm. um, that you would see in society. Um, and yeah, I think it's a clever trick to a clever, a clever way, a, a good thing to do it. In a way, it kind of. Let's just put this in another weird Hegel way. It removes your abstract thinking, right? Mm -hmm. it, 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 it takes away those easy judgments that you pass down on society all the time. Or, the, for example, the Japanese media passes down on everyone all the time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, like, oh, what, he was an otaku? Oh, oh that's why he killed someone. Okay. okay. Uh, the criminal was Sanju Gosai, Mushoku, Dokushin. <laughs> yeah. yeah. He, right, he was kinda... unemployed and unmarried? That means he's a bad person. Oh, that means he's a bad person, right? Like <laughs> essential information, right? Thanks, uh, guys. Check abstract thinking one and two, right? Like we have a. It's like they have to break it down to some like math pattern to like like. Well, is he unemployed? Okay. Is he married? No. Ooh, strike two. Does is he an otaku? Ooh, strike three. He's a murderer. It, uh, it was totally him. One, two, three. Why would you have sympathy for people like that? They're disgusting. <laughs> uh, yeah, you. There's no way I'm similar to that guy. Yeah, no way. Like yeah. we're totally different. Totally different. Come from different universes, perhaps. Yeah. And I think that's the, that's what they're going for. What I'm saying. And you know, see how different this is. This person is from upstanding citizens like you. You know, you know don't don't fear that your neighbor could be a murderer because he's married. To, that's a job. Yeah, yeah, that would you, they could never happen. Yeah. <laughs> Don't worry, the monsters are all out there. They're not in here. It's all okay. You know, we're purple and green. <laughs> <laughs> all the yeah. monsters. Oh, they're all purple and green. Yeah. Right. Safe, you're safe. It's all okay. Yeah. They, they have this very comforting message. That's right. um, it's not inside of you. 
<laughs> yeah, but there's, so I really like this part of tragedy, but there's something that that we were just talking about a little bit earlier before we came on the air. Is, um, so I really like this, and I really understand this. Like, tragedy gets you into the head of, I don't know, failures or sometimes even, I don't know, criminals, and gives you feelings of sympathy for them. But Rennie says, like, you know, what is it, the Pascal statement? Like, to, to understand is to forgive. Okay, I don't know. I feel like I'm hitting a kind of a wall there, though. Like, I get it. I get what he's saying, but sometimes when you understand, you still don't forgive. I, I even says even the yeah. tragedies condemn. Right? I condemn. think we can still condemn. I think. Um, yeah, you're. I mean, I think we could we could understand, but what? I don't know. Maybe I would hesitate to take out the condemning too. Right. Maybe not forgive, but mm, well, because they can still be guilty. But maybe they, maybe you can understand. Like for example. How that's part of you too. He mentions this in the book too, right? Mm. Maybe you too share this possibility. Like you too could be, I don't know, monstrous mm. inside. Um. Yeah, I know. I think it definitely would be a mistake to to just like lift off the condemning. Yeah. So uh, I don't know. Like I, I don't know. It it's a. I just I thought like I know like I'm, you can't forgive Hitler, mm. even if you've understood him. Mm. Um, so I mean like, yeah, I mean it would be interesting to get a close up glimpse of Hitler. And many people they love to write books about Hitler, mm. but I don't know like it's not necessarily that we're trying to forgive Hitler, but maybe we're trying to see maybe as a warning to ourselves or what part of us would do that, what part of us would be like that, could do something like that. Well, where th it is kind of odd to say, to say forgive Hitler, or because it seems you know there's such a disconnect back there. Or would do you even forgive him? Do you even have that type of relationship with him? Um, True. I understand how you know, oh to um, you know uh, like for example if you study history, we even wonder why you know Japan would go to war with him. Or, with America and the Western powers in World War II, we kind of stay as like, okay, uh, I see, you know, it might not still, whether or not it was a good idea is arguable, but you can at least kind of understand that there's a reasoning there. Mm. Uh, similar with Hitler, you know, you can understand that, you know, perhaps there was, you know, especially in his case, you know, there were probably smarter solutions, but he came, but he saw a problem and came up with a solution. Yeah, mm. the final one. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I guess the problem is like, I, or the thing is, it, it you can see how it would make sense for him. You know what I mean? Like it, it's not inexplicable. It's not alien. Yeah. It, it made sense. Yeah. From uh, like his point of which view. Which maybe that's a good thing. Instead of being Hitler, like some kind of alien monster, right? Like maybe you, you know, the, the message should be, he's just like you. So or he's closer to you than you think. So be careful, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, you could easily. You know, I mean, it's 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 not like when when something bad appears before you, it's not there's not going to be a, a red alarm flashing, right? It could easily just as easily make sense to you too, mm. to 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 do something wrong. I mean, that that's what you have to watch out for. Yeah. Isn't that isn't that part of kind of what tragedy is teaching you? It would just as easily seem to fit to you too as it would to him or to Fuminori or to anyone. Yeah. Okay. Good. Yeah. Okay. I think that's a good. Way to wrap that up. Let's talk about comedy. Mm. What's the essence of comedy? It's social justice. Oh, ouch. <laughs> so, Every oh, comedian is a social justice warrior? Oh, my God. <laughs> I read the book, and I was like, oh, my God. I was shedding tears. Really? Social justice warriors? Uh -huh. <laughs> but I can't, he's suggesting that they're all kind of some comedy, not all comedy. Yeah, it, right. can't, it simply can't be true puns and things like that. That's like social justice. It's, it's a critique I mean, of puns. I think what he what he's saying applies to some art, yeah. some comedy, um, yeah. right? Um, We're not all social justice warriors. <laughs> <laughs> it's the kind of but he kind of puts a comedy can help improve things can be a good way to attack, but. I mean, it goes back. Just going back to our other video on disgust, right? We mentioned uh, we talked about humor in there a little bit. I mean, he said he even brings this up. He says like, humor is a is a way to 
uh, is a place to, to show off your vulnerability, right? To show that you're not alone in these vulnerabilities. I mean, even even in a sense, like you could play with things that you think are bad, but but you you realize them as bad. You know what I mean? Like you realize them as vulnerabilities, ho- hopefully. And you show that you're not alone in struggling with these aspects of your character, and community, I mean, that, community building. Community building with with humor. So he yeah. he does bring up that aspect. So that's two things, right? Critique of vices and community, like mm-hmm. sharing what what you consider to be very private concerns, mm-hmm. and finding out that everyone else is worried about the exact same thing as you were, right? With yeah. the best comedians often do this, like Louis C.K. and stuff, right? Yeah, right? Like, We've talked about this book, uh, with, yeah. about him yeah. before, too, right? Like, he says all these things, you're like, oh, my God, but, you know, I was thinking that, too, kind yeah. of thing. And, and they, part of that humor comes from, like, oh, my God, I'm, you know, I'm we're the same, and then the, that spirit of community is born, and, uh, you know, hopefully that will relieve some of those little pressures, like, yeah. okay, we're all in the same boat here, right? Yeah. I, it's interesting. I, you could take it in two ways, though. You mean like it could be like, oh my god, we're thinking the same thing. That's actually the right way to think. <laughs> or it could be, oh my god, we're thinking the same thing. I'm sure glad he's still struggling with that, like I am. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like it could easily, yeah, it could easily swing both ways depending on how uh, how crazy you are. <laughs> yeah, right. I mean, like well, of course, everything could be taken the wrong way, mm-hmm. which is why comedy has an edge, right? Which mm-hmm. is why there are some. I'll, I'll just say it. There are some social justice people that, that take it like they don't believe that that think people are too weak to take comedy the right way, or they don't think that enough people are understanding comedy the right way. Or it it's it could be used in the effort of social ill. Yeah. Yeah, but that again, that all depends on your understanding of comedy. How are you taking the joke? Um, mm. And the, you know, you just have to realize that. Some people are laughing at the joke because they're like, wow, you know, I feel the same way sometimes, and I'm glad someone else is out there like that. Mm. I don't know. It, I guess it just depends on the tone of the joke and what you're laughing at. I mean, like, the tone kind of starts walking a fine line himself. Yeah, it's yeah, like, yeah, yeah, it's used to punch up. Yeah. It's never used to punch down. No. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> like, right now we're talking about punching up and punching down, which I don't know. I don't know how much sense that makes, but... Um, Com- comedy is used to, I don't know, it, it is used to bully people back into the status quo. Yeah. Um, it often is. It's ha ha ha, look at your weird name. Yeah. And the Japanese do that to themselves all the time. They even have a name for it, Kira Kira name. Uh, well, you've got a crazy name. Ha! I think, all right. I don't know if that's funny, but maybe you think it is. I don't know. Um, yeah, anytime an otaku is on TV. Yeah. Like, ha ha ha. Yeah. And so it, it, it can be used as a. Again, I think these people consider it, though, as a critique of vice. Mm. They, they yeah. think that they're eliminating vice in the world. Yeah. Totally. Totally. So, yeah, they think they're right. I mean, they're not. But they think they are. So. Mm. Um, so I, I guess maybe for them, it's to them it's not even like punching up or punching down. It's not all about that. It's like that's stupid, right? Like let's fix that. Um, vice critique. Ah, it's like vice. Yeah. All right. All right. Anyway. So like, <laughs> I, there's there there are, I don't know. This is like in, in all of these there are like these weird dangerous aspects that I know. Right? Both of these can talk about, right? I like know. like I, I guess we're gonna have to, I might as well bring it up now, like. There are ways to comfort your status anxiety that are not healthy. Yeah. And he, he doesn't really mention those, but we all know what they are. Yeah, right? oh, totally. Racism. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nationalism. Self-deception. Self-deception. <laughs> abusive personalities. Humor. Mm-hmm. Even abusive humor. Um, yeah, yeah. These are all ways. They're very effective ways to... Mm. To cover up uh, your lack of status, um, and you can see them all the time, from Donald Trump to Japanese net right wingers. Um, you know, uh, what is I mean, like it's interesting. What is Donald Trump, but like the ultimate like status man? 
right? Like, he is, like, mm-hmm. status anxiety exemplified to a thousand degrees. Like, he's a super awesome businessman. That means he's good and smart and moral, by the way. Yeah. And his promise is, like, well, America has slipped in status in the world. They're all laughing at us. And then, you know, <laughs> autism intensifies. It's going to be laughing at you. I like, there is that what everyone thinks? Like, the, they think that everyone is laughing at America and around the world, like, ha, ha, ha. I mean, like, it's just, it's so crazy outside of America to hear that, right? Like, that, well, Americans are just a joke outside. I mean, like, really? Yeah. 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 Are we, are, 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 is America the butt of every joke? Really? I mean, like, we might be hated uh, by some countries, but, I mean, let let me just assure Americans, other countries have lots of problems. And they don't, they don't have time to laugh at America. Like, you think that the Koreans and the Japanese and the Chinese are spending all their time thinking about America? Man, no, they're too busy hating each other. Uh, and by that, I mean each, other con- each other's countries and themselves inside the country. So, man, they got their plates full. Uh, they are so full of things to do and hate. They don't got time to be like, Obama is such a weak guy. They don't got time for that. It's not what's happening. So, uh, what is this like? We're losing our place in the world. Like, okay, sure. I mean, maybe we're losing our military dominance over large portions of it. But I don't know. Are, are they laughing at us, like Donald Trump says? I don't think so. The the ironic thing is this, is one of the you know few times I've ever in like the past month. Um, I'm able to watch the news more frequently. One of the few times I actually talk about America on the news. Was, well, it's, yes, they were laughing at America, but they were laughing at Donald Trump. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, this, this promise to make America great again, like, I mean, like, if, if it's just simply about economic concerns and how much they've increased the monetary supply, like, that's all great, but th- none of this seems like it comes from, like, I don't know, the bookish economists. This sounds like it's coming from a lot of people that are very concerned about a drop in status. Hmm. As in, like, they're sharing their status with people they don't want to share it with, uh, or, uh, well, it's either that or it's these kind of fears of contamination from immigration, right? Mm-hmm. Which is the core of this kind of, I don't know, cuck-servative or whatever, this this disgust toward contamination by foreigners. Um, but it, it feels like this weird, insane status anxiety mixed with disgust. To me. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Maybe I could be wrong. So all the Donald Trump supporters it kind of works together. I see that people come in, they ruin America. Our status goes down. Um, it's like a point. More come in. Yeah. More yeah. Come in, more come in, and it's... the status goes down. Right. Like because like you know if if the story you're telling yourself is like because you've got nothing else, the story you're telling yourself is, um, you know, I'm great because I'm American, which is one good way to relieve status anxiety. In fact, Volcano kind of, kind of that. suggests that you do that a little bit. It's interesting uh, he mentions yeah. that in the religion chapter, but or the Christianity chapter. But <laughs> at least. This is a... You're playing with a dangerous tool here, right? Mm. You're kind of playing with fire a little bit. right? It, it's not saying... Uh, which I'm not... I don't know, but I don't want to say don't have pride in your country. I think America has a lot to be proud about. Mm. Honestly, I think we do. Uh, and I think what we try to do sometimes, is something to be very proud of. And I'll say that out loud. I think we were a noble experiment. I don't think people understand what it is, but it was a noble experiment. Uh, Parts of it were. So there's stuff to be proud of. So, yeah, that's okay. But, wow. I don't know. It's freaking me out how much status anxiety seems to be like this, like... If, if, if there's any sick core to America, it's status anxiety. Like, the sickest core of it all. Like, is, is the, like there's something close to what ails every single person. I don't know. I can feel it. Mm-hmm. The, claim, why does it always have to be claims of making America great again? Like, we're gaining our status. It's always this. It's always this. Mm. Well, maybe that's just a cover for anti-immigration feelings. I don't know. <laughs> I think... Or just it's it's like you said the a cycle of you know immigrate immigrants make America less great, lowering our status. Yeah, I um, I, oh. I I do think some people feel that, but like, whatever. We're off on a tangent. Like yeah, just 
it, it's interesting though, just uh, when this, when he when Bolton talks about like how how people can will, will are willing to suffer a lot as long as they get that love that they desire so much. Like so, I think they would if people were like, yeah, America's number one, they'd be willing to put up with a lot of. On stuff they should, probably shouldn't put up with, you know what I mean? Like just to get that number one slot. Um, and speaking of that, let's go into the politics. Because, yeah, well then they'd have to believe that you know America is corrupt at some level, and yeah. that would that would destroy their one source of status, anxiety relief. Yeah, and to, to believe that would to be to believe that America is is deeply flawed is everywhere else on the planet. Imagine that, right? Like, oh my God, it's the same. It's it's it has flaws. Oh my God, but that that just simply can't work anymore because to believe that would ruin something else. So yeah. there's politics. I like that part in politics, right? I mean, but the politics was just understanding ideology. Yeah, right. And, and understanding that like life hasn't always been like this. Yeah. Right. For a while, it was the greatest thing in the world was to be close to God. That was just the thing, or to be a knight. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Or a Spartan. <laughs> yeah, I mean, really, that's the whole the, the whole thing boiled down to understanding ideology. It's interesting. I don't know. I just I read the chapter and I was kind of like, hmm. I mean, I guess it could relieve your status anxiety in the sense that you're like, well, I guess it, things don't have to be this way. Like my inf- my my low status is not something that like part of the natural order of things. Um, yeah, but or also, we could change it. Exactly. We could change it. We could change it. Why does um, it only have to be one thing, namely business? Yeah, right. I mean, I, I, I'm assuming that's the core of the, the status anxiety relief. I just, it's just interesting. I don't just maybe think about the new Tractatus and how, like, <laughs> that would, like, freak so many people out. You know what I mean? Like, it causes all this other anxiety, like, about the the... the the instability of the world, like they want people want to believe that the world is is solid, you know what I mean? Like, and here you are walking around, <laughs> saying like, well, it doesn't have to be this way. Um, so I, I guess you could cause a lot of so other. It becomes anxiety. like the unbearable lightness of being. Exactly right. Yeah, you're just like this walking anxiety creation machine. <laughs> you go from like it, it doesn't have to be this way to anything goes. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I mean, like, it, at least you could basically say, well, why can't the past come back again? I mean, it's possible. I mean, Nietzsche, I think we disagree here, but it's possible. I mean, like, what, why couldn't, like, love be closeness to God? Some people still believe that, too. But yeah. There are so, echoes of the past still around today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was thinking, what, I mean, you know, one thing conservatives do, do that, you know, liberals can't understand is, you know, upset you about... For example, most recently, gay marriage. Like, why are you giving other people options things that I don't want to take? Yeah. Like, they feel like this is an assault on you know the, their religion, their belief. You've said I I wonder if there's not a status anxiety element to this. Like you know by saying that what other you know I take pride in my status as a good Christian or whatever it is, by giving other people well, paths that aren't the same one I took, it devalues use the path I took. It's almost like saying there are more than, there's more than one right answer? Oh my god, yeah. Right. Yeah. How dare they? Um, yeah, I think definitely that's, that's part of it. Definitely. Um, share, sharing status always devalues it. The more, the more people are there. So this means. is where it gets into that weird section in the religious section, though. Well, not weird, but I mean, interesting. Really interesting where he talks about community, though, in the Christianity section. Oh, uh, big part of the group. There you are sharing it. Yeah, there you are sharing it with everyone. Hopefully, it's, it's, what's greatest about you is what you share. Yeah, right. Yeah. What is what is non-individual about you becomes what's great. I mean, it, it weirdly reverberates with Ortega's mass men. And <laughs> like we, uh, yeah, we share what's non-individual about us, or like even like the true believer on some levels too. Uh, I, I guess at that point you're just like throwing away your individu- individuality, your individual aspects for for something else. Maybe if I if I could try to save it, it would be have to be something like they. Every one of us has uh, value. 
that can't be measured in a number. Okay, I mean, sure. Um, there's something like, I don't know, in the thing in itself is in life, right? Like, there's, there's just something, uh, there's an empty space there that we, we shouldn't try to be putting into some kind of numbered system. It just, it just feels like in those communities, those communities would be the ones being like, you know, get out. You know what I mean? Like, weirdos get out. No. Oh. Right? Like, Hopefully, is, if they followed their principles, they couldn't do that. Yeah, right? If, if it was like a, a universal aspect of humanity, they couldn't really say that. That's true. That's true. Uh, yeah, okay. I mean, they have to say that life itself has an inherent value. <laughs> Only human life, though, for stupid animals. Yeah. Uh, you can kill those all you want, right? Yeah, yeah. Whatever. These things aren't alive, really. Oh, but anyway... Like it had to be like everybody has some kind of inherent value, and um, even if you've lost it all, you there's still, still something that. about you that mm -hmm. is worth. You can't just be I don't know sold for pieces. Mm. I guess is that what? Yeah, I mean, yeah. Is that but what's it's, greatest it seems about like you? A very, it seems like a very thin. Yeah, uh, it, it, it seems like it'd be very hard to maintain that belief, right? I mean, it would be one of the weakest things, right? That you could you you could defend. It just reminds I don't know. It just this freakishly freakishly reminds me of like Ortega's mass man, who's kind of like, um, I mean I don't know. I just like when Ortega was complaining about the mass man. He's kind of like, well, the mass man's kind of like, well, why should I improve myself? I'm good just the way I am. <laughs> so yeah. screw you. <laughs> he's just kind of doing whatever the hell he wants. He treats the whole world like it's his living room, and he's like, well, I'm good. What are you talking about? Yeah, I don't have to. I don't yeah. have to improve, right? I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk in the movie theater, and I'm gonna litter on the streets, or you know, whatever like, the hell. It seems like Bolton, Bolton is aware of this, right? Like, but yeah, he's he like, is. well, this is. is not what I'm saying. Is not that you should give up all your desires to do anything, because that, but that there are different sources of yeah. Value. I mean, that's how that's how he wraps the whole thing up, right? That is how he wraps the because whole. Because it's a dangerous up. thing to be like, well, you don't have to really do anything. You can be a special flower and not do anything. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, okay. First of all, it's really hard to maintain. I don't think people could do that. But if they tried, you know, it would just end up being like Tumblr. Or no. Um, it would just <laughs> end up being like, you know, I know, like the masked man or something. <laughs> you know what is kind of interesting, like, just in that section on, on, on Christianity in the community section, though? I have to say, like, when he said, like, making great public spaces... I just sometimes when I walk um, when I'm alone, I I used to have to go to Shinjuku every night for for my job as an out service. And like just when you're walking alone in Shinjuku at night through those tall buildings, you do feel kind of uplifted. I I do anyway. I like cityscapes to begin with. Mm. I I think I think that side of Shinjuku, the other side, not the uh, way that way that way that be the west side, the west side, west side of Shinjuku. The, the, like all these office buildings, I think it's beautiful. I think it's absolutely beautiful. I just feel uplifted just walking through there. I kind of just felt a, an unexplainable pride in just being part of it. Right. So I get it. I get it. I can feel. I feel like this uplifting by great public spaces. I can see that. Like, wow. I can't believe I'm a part of this. I'm. I'm, I'm contributing to this. Um, that did make me feel good. Even then, no, I don't go there anymore. So you know, whatever. But that is, that is the power of community, though. Right? Like, if if they can make you feel that no matter how small a part you are, you're part of something really that's good. Mm. Right? You can take pride in that. Yeah, just yeah. Gotta, yeah. Just got to make sure that it actually is a good. It's thing. good. You're right. I mean, this is why it seems like you couldn't get rid of the philosophy part. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, if you got rid of the philosophy part, like. You, you have the chance of going off into crazy zones. You're like, whatever my country does is right. Yeah, like uh, Nazi-esque things. Like, oh, that's fine. It's my community. Yeah. Whatever, right? May, I feel good to be part of my community. So we still need philosophers in our in our great public spaces, I would think. Yeah, and speaking of great public spaces, I mean, like, if you really take a really good look at your life, I mean, like, and when you're not at home or at work, where are you? I mean, you just think about it. You're probably shopping. Oh, right. yeah, okay, okay, yeah. I mean, like, a good percentage of that time is spent shopping. Or at Starbucks. Food or in a mall or, 
Yeah. You're shopping for something, right? Like, mm. Yeah, I mean, just think about that for a while. It starts to get to you. You're kind of like, it kind of reminds me of like the time before the World Wide Web. Remember, we used the the the, the internets before the World Wide Web was a thing. Like FTP and Golfer, you remember? Yeah, like, that? remember, like, there was like, not having the World Wide Web wasn't really a thing, right? Like, we're like, okay, yeah, but we can just like FTP and like, you know, uh, over these sites and download some things and like, Usenet and that was Usenet and like it was like okay that's the internet now people can't imagine the internet without the World Wide Web, right? Like it seems like well what's that FTP or I mean like it's in there it was in there, or Gopher or something right? Like um, it feels the same way with it feels the same way with shopping right? Like what do you mean what would you do outside of shopping right? Like sometimes when you walk out in the cities you're kind of like well, that's all there is isn't it? It's just shopping. That's you can do I, you could do IRC. In real life, <laughs> <laughs> it kind of feels like you know there's nothing more to do but big shopping areas, like from from the vast swaths of, of of land, and the most money is devoted towards vast areas of giant shopping, mm. and then the rest is just kind of like poorly maintained something, and if you're lucky, you get a park, maybe. Yeah. Is anyone there? Eh, maybe, maybe, right. I don't know. It seems like our our vast open public spaces are just gi- by giant shopping centers. Mm. Signs to keep the system running, man. You know, look at that. You you need that, right? You don't have that. What's wrong with you? Um, I don't know. Even if you're just honest with yourself, I I I'd, I'd estimate that you know a great majority of my time outside of my house, unfortunately, is spent shopping. It's really, you know, I mean, it's it's a necessity to buy food, but. What do you do when you go into the city? Not working? Yeah. 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 This is not working. Yeah. Working is also part of the cog, but yeah. This be sitting in the izakaya doesn't count, huh? Well that's consumption. Yeah, it's consumption. So it doesn't count, huh? It doesn't count as non shopping. Uh, you're spending like I, I don't worry, I know that you're spending like eighty hours in a museum all the time, so don't worry. I know. Oh, oh wait, well, no, yeah. no, no. Of course. Of course, all my museum time. Yeah. Public concerts and you know, community events. And when I lived in Yokohama, I used to ride the boats a lot. Does that count? Like, I didn't have to pay to ride the boats. You but... used public transportation, is what you're saying, or it or was, that was just the... to, it. Was, it wasn't like to get anywhere. You just go around on the boat. Oh, okay, that's you don't okay. Actually I'll, go I'll count anywhere. that as not shopping. Though. Okay, well, Yokohama then. You have to go to Yokohama. And ride on the Marine Rouge or the Marine Shuttle. Yeah. I mean, I'm doing the, the best in this category. I, mean, I spend most of my time outside of work and ha- house, which are one and the same for me, goddammit. <laughs> it's about <laughs> exercising. Oh, there you go. Okay. All right. You kind of got like a special, you're out in the, the country, a little more in the country, so that's good, baby. Yeah. Like, but aren't you that. consuming your calories? Oh, oh, checkmate. Oh, checkmate. Well, but you see, that's, that's my metabolism doing the shopping, not Okay, me. okay, <laughs> all right. <laughs> um, what else do you want to say, like, we come down to the end here? Like, okay, let me, let me just, uh, like, let me just, like, right get to the end here. This we're, gonna talk, we're not going to talk about death, keeping death oh, in mind. That's right. Oh, death. Yeah, there we go. We'll, we'll add death, and then let's go to Bohemia and finish this thing up. Uh, there's not much to say. It's just simply true. Keeping death in mind reminds you um, what's really important. You know what? I remember that uh, the Ulm Supreme Cult sect had a similar idea. And, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I was saying, don't go crazy with the death thing. Yeah, um, I know. The samurai, as I said, the samurai always kept death in mind. Right. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, but the Christianity also reminds you of death and skulls and things like. But it's a good thing. Like you will die, mm. you're gonna die, and you know. So stop. <laughs> I love how they put little trinkets in those pictures. They have a skull and a mm. uh, a, a clock or some kind of what is it? Uh, I can't think of the name of it. The sand. Hourglass. Sand. Hourglass. Uh, sand <laughs> clock. Um, an hourglass, and then they have little baubles like chess. Pieces are cards, and like, yeah, you're spending your time on frivolities, but you're gonna die, man. So remember what's important. Um, obviously, it's it's video games. Um, yeah, that's why I didn't put them in. Obviously, it's super hexagon. Yeah, super hexagon in video games. That's why they never put the video games in those pictures. 
<laughs> That's what's truly important. Um, so, Dustin, you, you're one of these people who goes around taking photographs of things. Um, yeah. Um, so, I don't would you say, like, I just, as, as reading the, the, the death section, I was kind of like, because I, I don't know, I, I, I have your... I have one of your cameras, actually. Yeah. But like, uh, but are are these guys who are like obsessed with taking pictures of like abandoned buildings and rusty drums? Are these people hooked on the death thing too? Oh, you mean like the Haikyo people? The yeah, Haikyo, buildings? all this stuff. Like people who like is it is this this the same idea like death? Like is this the same relief? Like even the like, buildings die, these things are dying out. Like it gives you kind of. How should I say a comfort by by looking at this decay and destruction, um, and a comfort in the sense that like what what the way he points it out how death death can relieve some of your status anxiety also in the sense that like, a lot of things yeah a lot of things you worry about are just kind of nonsensical yeah death reclaims us all and you know eventually Tokyo is going to look like one of those uh, abandoned factories right one day mm-hmm. you know. Who knows when? I mean, yeah. I mean, like, I was. I find myself addicted to those pictures too. I, I, I quite like them. Um, I don't know. They can be a source of comfort, and they can be a source of real anxiety too. Uh, like, there's that photographic book called Tokyo Nobody. Oh, I love they, that book. Yeah, it's a great book, and it's just the pictures of Tokyo with nobody in it. Right? They, they just happen to take pictures when there's like usually very busy areas of Tokyo, and it's, they're just. There's nobody there, but that just—I think that book is like, if anything, it's it's unnerving. That book, it it, it it's like this anxiety about, I don't know, a childless Japan. I guess, uh, you know, the Japan with a shrinking and dying population that's disappearing. Um, Not with weird like computer ghosts making people the stains. No, 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 go, no computer ghosts in this one. Unfortunately, so we can. It would be great if it went out like that, but like. <laughs> red tape doors and computer ghosts. Unfortunately not. It's just uh, eerie pictures of Tokyo with nobody in it. Kind of like, I don't know, like all the old arcades these days, right? There's just nobody there. Yeah. And nobody playing at the arcade anymore. Arcade nobody. Game center nobody. Whereas uh, the Haikyuu feel more comforting. Or if you want to use them in creepy stories, I suppose. They yeah, I mean, they, they do work in like, creepy pasta and stuff. but I find them to be comforting, though. I like them. There's a weird, 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 like, um, fusion, like a yugo between the nature and, you know, man made civilization with the high kill. Uh, uh, like a nature reclaiming, like, what was lost kind of thing? Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, like at the end of Final Fantasy VII? I was actually thinking, like, it, like in various Ghibli films. Ah, yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, like, it, it's weird, though. Like, you, both of you have seen pictures of uh, Fukushima, right? You've seen mm-hmm. nature reclaiming Fukushima. How do you yeah, feel yeah. about those? I mean, I think you're going to feel a little differently about those, but what do they yeah. make you feel? They probably make you feel nervous. I don't know. Yeah. It, it didn't give me much comfort, that's for sure. That's for sure. <laughs> I, it looked like, like an episode of The Twilight Zone, maybe, but... So sometimes it's not like Jesse. I did, I, you, probably to you, it doesn't make you feel calm, seeing as how you're so close. The the oh, word uh, fills me with anxiety. Okay. I met somebody the other day, day at the park. We were you know watching our kids play. He's like, hey, hey, where are you from? You're from around here. I'm like, yep, just next town over. Like, well, we came from Fukushima. And I suddenly felt a little bit anxious. <laughs> No, it was a great guy. It felt nothing towards him, just that name. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and seeing nature reclaim it already, it's really kind of freaky. But anyway, so, but I think as a, as a, as a, it is a useful thing to remember that you're going to die. Uh, just don't go crazy with it, that's all. Like, <laughs> don't use death to remind people. <laughs> like, don't kill people to do it. Like, Om, Om Supreme Call Tech sect, the Om Supreme cult, Supreme Truth cult actually tried to do that in Japan, right? I mean, like, they tried to blow up parts of Tokyo and kill people so that they would remember what's important, right? What they think is important. So, it can be taken a little bit too far. Obviously, right? 
obviously. Mm. It goes without saying, but it's just kind of funny that they had that idea, too. Mm. Um, so, uh, other than I mean, Momento Mori, which I, I know, I really, actually, the Momento Mori is something I find really powerful, actually. Oh, me too. I love those. Yeah. I think it's a very powerful thing to to use. Mm. I, I think it's something that's essential to philosophy, right? Maybe uh, for existentialism or philosophy at all, like, you're going to die. So yeah. Make your choices. Being toward death. I mean, that we're going to get into that with Heidegger. We, when, when we get to Heidegger, too. And his interpretation of being towards death. So I, uh, this will be good to remember for that. So definitely bookmark that. Uh, Camus, I remember Camus too. He was obsessed. With, but anyway, um, <laughs> in a crazy way, ISIS is obsessed with death too. Yeah. So. Yeah, 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 yeah. There was this criminal, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Well, anyway, there was, yeah, there was like this guy who's like this criminal. I can't remember. If it was, it was in one of, uh, uh, I can't, I can't remember his name. This book's Japanese uh, writer's book. He talked about this guy. He didn't care about death any, or death didn't affect him anymore. Like, so he just went around. You know, I mean, he he just came, became so used to the concept of him, himself dying, he just went around killing people because he didn't care. Oh, he's kind of like, oh, this is what this guy claimed. And I was like, oh, wow, okay, I suppose you could take it the other way, too. Um, you were being re-reminded of your death could could just kind of be like, well, I can just do whatever the hell I want. Um, so we go into Bohemia and just finish this thing up? All right, I do, I want to say, like, I'm just going to ask you guys straight up. Like, I know this, of all my torn feelings about Bohemia... I have to say I'm strangely attracted to it. I mean, I, I think it's it's in me. It's, it's it was in me to begin with. You know what I mean? And when I when we're talking about like how like this this idea of like work corrupting your soul kind of thing, like I can resonate with that. But I even like even even the even wackier side of it, more like like creating a community of people with similar values. Even though that would I just the disaster is like I can see it right here. I could just see it. It's like right in front of me. Um, I mean, I, I I seriously doubt this channel could hold together more than five people. You know what I mean? Like, it okay, could that happen? I seriously doubt it. But it's still, I find it eerily attractive to try. Yeah, I'm, I mean, of all the solutions that he listed, maybe the ones that I am most lean towards had to be number one, philosophy, number two, art, and three, bohemia. Maybe art and bohemia are, are mixed together in my mind, like, and, and of course in my mind, it kind of like avant-garde, I don't know, mm. dangerous or, or challenging art um, is really attractive to me, if it's done well. Right. Um, you know, like, for example, my, my favorite Japanese game creators, back to video games, my favorite Japanese game creators are all, I don't know, weird. Just to put it bluntly. Uh, Suda51, Swerty, and, and Kojima, Hideo Kojima, they're all kind of weird. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Kojima being the most mainstream, but a, a lot of them try to take weird chances, at least. Um, I find that to be an attractive part of their art. They're not playing by the numbers all the time. Mm. They're trying to be a little bit goofy and out there, and they're trying to open up new avenues of seeing the world. And uh, yeah, I found myself quite attracted to that avant-garde part of them, mm. the weird part, the over-the-top crazy part. I think we need that. I need that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I just yeah. yeah. I mean, it's he, he, he talks about some of the excesses. Possible in Bohemia too. Right, you can see that even some of these guys I mentioned, like sometimes they're just crazy for the sake of being crazy. Yeah. I mean, I just, uh, yeah. I mean, I, I, I sometimes I could just see myself just thinking like, well, so what? You know what I mean? Like, so you brought a lobster onto the street to walk as a pet. Good job. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> like, yay. Uh, I guess. Oh, aren't you crazy? Maybe hopefully the the message you can take is live your life your way. Yeah, yeah. I mean, don't be a cow town. 
I think I think a group like that would have to be maintained by some kind of like real re-reminding of the empathy or the, what what you're after. Constant re-reminding yourself of what it is you're after, and kind of sharing a sympathy with with all the people there. In the fact that like you're all together in this plight, trying to live out a, a set of values that aren't supported by mainstream society. I, I just feel like you'd, you'd need to be so forgiving for eccentricities and things that would just seem to make no sense that are done just just for the sheer sake of annoying other people, too, sometimes. Mm. What if he said to you, well, what gives you the right to walk dogs all over the street? Because everybody else does <laughs> because you're, lo- you want to, you're after your lobsters. <laughs> I guess. I guess the thing is, like, I mean, that's fine. I. I, I guess. The, I don't know. If, I don't know why I have a right to walk a dog down the street too. I mean, I, I guess it's. I'm calling into question dog walking. <laughs> that's been called into question now. I mean, okay, it's kind of funny, I guess, too. But if I walk my lobster down the street, <laughs> but. I, I, what does it mean in the end? Probably not much. I mean, like, I, I like I like avant-garde art that actually ends up having some kind of meaning. Hopefully, mm-hmm. like Lost Highway or something like these films that you know are, are weird but also meaningful in a certain way. Um, but I mean, like, can't challenging or even crazy art can't can't it be something even even if it's not connected specifically to something meaningful? Can't an unusual choice sometimes be a good thing? Oh, definitely. I think I don't know. I just why this why I just think it's so tough to keep a community like this together. You'd have to kind of keep on telling yourself that all these dead ends could be fruitful new things in the future. Like you don't even know what these all will mean in the end. Yeah. Um, or sometimes this, just just because it, it's so easy to slip into this is the way things are. I mean, yeah. if any if anything, we don't. Do we need a reminder that like? of the common, or do we need a reminder of the other possibilities? Yeah. I mean, like, I mean, on a, bit, on a big scale, we probably need a reminder that there are other ways. Mm. And, you know, there's going to be this, and, yeah, I don't know, do you, do you think that we're suffering from a glut of people that are doing too many crazy things on the street? I, I don't think so. I, I mean, so. maybe in America, I have no idea anymore, but, I mean, like, you know, in middle America and stuff, there's, even we don't have it there, and, like, I don't know, is, is Tokyo like this kind of wacky fun house of clowns and monsters? No. Um, according to the West... Well, yeah, according to the racist Western media, right, that writes Japan is crazy reports all the time because they're racist. Um, yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, Japan is a wacky playground of sex, monsters, and violence. But if you're not a racist weirdo, like all of the press about Japan... And then you realize that actually Japan is pretty normal. Mm. Kind of... Maybe to the point where they need a little shaken up. Mm. I mean, unless you're just walking Akihabara every Sunday. Well, then you're going to see some weird stuff. Although it's still predominantly yeah. normal. It's pretty yeah. tame. It used to be much better when they opened the streets up and they had people doing live performances on the streets. That was pretty... I was really... I was loving that. It's like, this is the dawn of a new era, man. It's the age of Otaku Aquarius. Mm. Good thing the authorities put a stamp down on that. Thank God for that. Um, um, and Kato. Yeah. Well, of course, they were probably looking for an excuse anyway. It's just... They were stamping down before that guy killed all those people. They were already doing it. Yeah. It started yeah, with that woman that was showing off her underwear on the street. Anyway, that's a different story. <laughs> <laughs> um, see, there are weird things that happen. Yeah, I grant yeah. you that. But... Um, most of, most of stories out of Japan run something like, I don't know, the economics for forecast is bad this quarter. <laughs> <laughs> Again? How many times can it be bad? Anyway. <laughs> right. um, so, and, and let's just say that they're not taking a holistic look at Japan. Oh, that, that mm-hmm. must be about that. And, uh, I like how Cracked even points this out now. But, like, they're the worst offenders of it, too. I know. Like, I know. Like, Cracked is, like, I finally got the courage to be like, oh, this, all this crazy Japan stuff, that's that's actually kind of racist. Um, and then they just keep on doing it. Nice. <laughs> okay, whatever, man. Yes, they're all watching 
tentacle porn here, and I don't know, walking around with pink hair. Yeah, that's Japan. <laughs> Just keep on believing that. Just keep on thinking that's true. On every corner, every street corner, is a tentacle porn shop. Yeah, it's all tentacle porn. That's all it is, man. Mm. What do you think I'm doing here? I specialize in tentacle porn. That's what I do. I run a shop. <laughs> uh, I do woodcuts of tentacle porn. Mm. I'm in the uh, business, actually. Oh, yeah, right. This is You translate the oohs and ahs. Of me. <laughs> <laughs> That's all we do here. Uh, oh, that in robots, obviously. Well, well yeah, robots. I can't, can't be bothered to walk to the convenience store, so I just get my robot and fly over. <laughs> obviously, mm. obviously. Uh, well, they are they are they are selling pepper, so I don't know. They do like robots here. I saw pepper, pepper today, actually. You saw pepper. I saw pepper today. He's in my local SoftBank shop. Wow. You know, SoftBank actually did have to tell its customers not have sex with with pepper. <laughs> they actually yeah. had to put that in the contract. So. Yeah. There you go. There you go. I'm doing the same thing as cracked. See, <laughs> my racist Japan reporting right now. <laughs> True. It's all true. The force, everything. <laughs> the stories, they're all true. All the stories, they're all true. Right? They're not old life <laughs> sense. It is tentacle porn all over. <laughs> I'm like the Han Solo of this universe. Mm. I'm telling you the force. Anyway, so we've lost our way. All right. I just want to say, like, I would hope, like, some of, I don't know. My only concern, my only thing that really freaks me out is, like, you ever watch, like, those prank channels on YouTube? Some of yes, the pranks are, like... I hate them so much. They're just vicious. It just feels like I just would I would hope any way anything that was shaking up the community would be not immorally vicious. You know what I mean? Like like some of the pranks that people do or supposed pranks or they they they, they later say that Christmas they're not. pranks were all stupid, right? Like it's always like, oh you got a new Xbox three sixty or Xbox One. And, but they they put original Xbox in the box and like haha, Wh- what? It's supposed to be funny, all right? Haha, fooled you. That's not a new Xbox. It's an old one. <laughs> Th- those videos are all over the place, man. I know. I like what? It's just viciousness. Some of it is just straight up viciousness. Like masking itself as humor and and and, and edginess. Yeah. I, I, I would hope it would be tinged by a bit of morality, empathy. <laughs> I it, it does it accomplishes nothing. It just proves you're a bad person. That's all it does. I I hate those videos so much. Anyway. Uh, so uh, I don't know. I just see that happening. I would. I don't know why. I just that flashes in front of my eyes. I would hate for that to happen. That's all. That's what the plebs think. Avant garde is come on. I know, it's right? Status anxiety against this. <laughs> like, oh, just take a fire hose on someone. Just take a hose on someone and shoot them, and then watch the reaction. <laughs> Isn't that wacky? No, that's you being vicious. <laughs> Yeah. So I guess that's about all I have to say for this. We've talked way too long anyway. I love this book. It's a great book. It should be in everyone's bookshelf. Oh, yeah. Um, again, uh, you know, maybe this book should be read in the future. I don't know. Um, I highly recommend anyone that hasn't to, to put this book onto their bookshelf and read it as quickly as they can. Mm. Essential for modern living. Yep. Make sure you pick up, because uh, there's a lot of versions out there. Make sure you pick up the most recent one. <laughs> you might not have this cover, but no. Uh, check to make sure this is the 2014 being reissued in this edition, 2014. So 2014 edition. I'm assuming it's the most recent one. If it's not, I'm going to be quite uh, surprised. This guy's been. It will mean this guy has been very, very busy. Check to make sure it doesn't say religion. Because <laughs> if it does, you got the old one. Square. <laughs> I'm going to be, be a snob without you. I'm going to be a book snob. I feel anxious for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> this is the new age, man. Books are like updated like iPhone apps now. <laughs> 
Just so wait right. for the. You just download the new book on your. Oh, you can't. Oh. Oh, it's in print. <laughs> Stupid text. Paper. Doesn't self Paper. update. Mm. Of course, the, yeah, the real snobs are saying that. That to you. <laughs> You're reading a paper book. Ooh. Uh, I bet you're reading it by candlelight, aren't you? <laughs> In the future, I'm going to be like those guys that collect like vinyl albums, though. I'll be like, oh, it just reads so much better. <laughs> Smell it, too, right? <laughs> the words sound better on a page. <laughs> I love the smell of dead trees. <laughs> the tactile interaction with the paper is a real important part of the experience. Yeah, 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 right? So I'm gonna I'm preparing my snobbery on top of your snobbery, so don't worry. We're building up <laughs> We're already training Japanese people to say these things already, so it's not worry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're already saying these things. <laughs> um, yes, paper books, I have lots of them, so I love the smell of dead trees too. Um, all right, that's all I have to say about this book and um, I don't know, any comments or, or things to say to us, please leave them down down in the comments section of the YouTube and subscribe and thumbs up and all yeah, that yeah. stuff. Otherwise, we'll be very worried. Yeah. Yes, yes please. Please show us that we are loved. Yes. Uh, reward our merits. All right. Reward our expectations. And, and have a happy uh, new year. Yeah, see, we're trying to save you from status and anxiety by having, you know, telling you this, and now you can have a happy new year. Have your avant-garde new year. Right. Mm. Celebrate the end of 2014 instead of 2015 tomorrow, or the, the day after tomorrow. Um, all right, so I guess we'll catch you guys next time for um, a different book. Mm. And um, see you then. Bye. <laughs>